Let's uh, nice. bring on uh, the master of all things holy when it comes to what we should watch, what we should see, streaming, music, movies, television. He's our Michael Snyder. Oh, and he always comes in on that lovely cloud of magic. Hi, Michael. Hey, hi. Hi, guys. Hey, Brett, you're halfway to Barry White, man. <laughs> That's Holy right. Crap. Can't get enough of your love, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Listen, I, I want to wish everybody a happy Halloween and uh, Halloween Eve. And, and, you know, this is going to be the first Halloween when the people without masks will be more frightening than the people in masks. <laughs> this is crazy, man. It is true. It is true. Anyway, I mean, for um, many areas, there'll be no, of, no Halloween at all. Go scary, ahead. Yes, speaking it, of. Yes. Uh, the Amy Coney Barrett, the justice, I mean, she's scarier than all Halloween's ghosts, vampires, and werewolves put together. So if you haven't done your civic duty already, please vote Tuesday's Election Day. You know the drill, guys. Yeah. Nice. Sounds like uh, Michael's made his mind up. That's the PSA based portion of the Mark Thompson program. Yeah, based on the, his uh, comments. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're done. We're done. You want to get on to some Halloween it's movies? Things to scare you? <laughs> it is all there, black and white, clear as crystal. Yes, let's get on with, uh, oh, this is a, the Craft Legacy. I know somebody was in the original Craft, and now they brought it back, right? Well, uh, the, the craftiest thing about the Craft Legacy <laughs> uh, is that it trades on the goodwill earned back in the day by this very diverting uh, teen witches wreak havoc in a suburban high school movie from 1996, The Craft. And that one is fun, although it's no Oscar winner, and it's most notable for giving a breakout role to the uh, idiosyncratic ingenue Feruza Balk and also uh, offering Nev Campbell a part beyond her old job on TV's Party of Five. But that was then the the craft legacy and update let me it just also really quick approach. shout out to uh the uh african-american member of the craft rachel true is her name she was in the chris rock film also back right then. okay yeah anyway go ahead we what's the new one like that, that's fair and this update doesn't really approach the snarky mystical a a a antics of the first film it does have an inclusive cast when it comes to the young witches in fact one of them is a trans girl one of them is black, like Rachel True. One is uh, Latinx. So kudos to the filmmakers, including uh, director screenwriter Zoe Lister Jones. Essentially, the story concerns shy Hannah, who has relocated to a new town because her single mom is going to marry a male empowerment lecturer who is a single dad living with three sullen teenage sons. And Hannah is misfit loner. Uh, swiftly taken in by the three novice witches who need a fourth to complete their circle and whose interest in magic and access to a book of spells is a given at the beginning of the movie, and it's never explained. Uh, the performers playing the teen witches, uh, especially as Hannah, are all solid, and that's the good news. The bad news is that the motivations, personal interactions, and backstories get quite muddled about halfway in after a promising start, and they get more out there as the movie proceeds. Um, on the uh, what are they up to now front, Michelle Monaghan plays Hannah's mom, and her prospective husband is played by David Duchovny. I mean, it looks like the truth is no longer out there. Uh, it's in the paycheck one gets for appearing in a B-movie. <laughs> uh, Lister Jones' first feature film, Band-Aid, was a lot of fun. This, not so much. Maybe she's dealing with sophomore slump. Even a cool out-of-left-field cameo didn't help the craft legacy live up to its legacy. Oh, well, oh, sorry about disappointing. that. Disappointing, uh, yeah. It's available via Voodoo, um, uh, Fandango Now, and other... Uh, Can you give you us know, the last line again? Because I feel that we missed that. Give us the last really? line again, please. Yeah. Oh, sure. A good old Zoom, right? Uh, I, I just said that... Um, no, it wasn't that. It's just that we missed it here. You know, we heard it, but go ahead. Say it again. Okay, even a cool out-of-left-field cameo didn't help the craft legacy live up to its legacy. Yeah, <laughs> legacy live up to a legacy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, that really I don't like necessary? to let something Moving like that on. get into the outfield on us. Go ahead. Moving on. Uh, there's a fine line between atmospheric and turgid or plodding, and despite a surplus of mood and an okay cast of what I presume are actors from across our northern border, uh, the Canadian supernatural movie The Curse of Audrey Earnshaw 
uh, didn't get my pulse racing or that true feeling of dread that you get from the best horror movies. Here, a cloistered backwards religious community in the boonies has stayed the same since its founding in the mid 1800s. And now it's the early 1970s and they're still horse and wagoning and, and suffering from infertile land, less than sustainable crops and bouts of illness. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the village, one woman is getting all sorts of veggies and such from her fields and the have nots are angry. And unbeknownst to the villagers, this woman is also hiding a beautiful teenage daughter named Audrey, who was conceived during an eclipse 17 years prior exactly when things went bad for everybody else in the community. Could sorcery be involved? And has young Audrey grown into a dangerous entity who will make matters worse for everyone? Eh, I wish I cared more. It wasn't a, a curse <laughs> to watch The Curse of Audrey, uh, Audrey uh, Earnshaw, but I was hoping for something yeah. more along the lines of The Witch, which gave me serious heebie-jeebies a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. That's also available via the usual uh, video-on-demand uh, locations on Yes. Yeah. The Curse of Audrey Earnshaw. And I would like to recognize the use for the first time on this show of the word turgid. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All right. Okay, Go ahead, I, I do what I can to, toward a colorful vocabulary to paraphrase Rocky the Flying Squirrel. And now for something I really liked. Dylan O'Brien, star of the Maze Runner movies. And one of that's one of the few young adults uh, series adaptations I actually tolerated is darned appealing as the star of Love and Monsters. This is a constantly entertaining, often exciting, sometimes emotional, and even wryly funny slice of dystopian sci-fi about young Joel Larson, who is trying to reconnect with his teen sweetheart seven years after they're separated and driven underground by an apocalyptic event that mutates all sorts of common fauna into deadly oversized predators. Uh, Joel has a hard time fending for himself. Still, love motivates him to leave the safety of this bunker uh, that he shares with more valiant survivalists and venture across 80 miles of creature-infested hills and dales to reach the coastal colony where his girlfriend has been holed up. Yeah, everyone is forced to hole up for their own protection. Does that remind you of anything? Anyway, pandemic <laughs> parallels aside... Love and Monsters is a tense journey through a dangerous landscape with all sorts of beasties and a satisfying coming-of-age movie propelled by the, the seemingly inexhaustible fuel of young romance. O'Brien is very good, and the supporting cast complements him well, especially the great Michael Rooker of, among other movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, as a grizzled older guy who has figured out how to navigate the treacherous surface world and tries to help Joel come uh, deal with the peril and find his way to the girl. Ably directed by Michael Matthews. I'm looking forward to his next wow. movie. Wow, this is a, he likes this, Brett. He mm. really likes this. Yeah. Love and Monsters, it's called. And where yeah, can we again, see it? Available in the usual um, uh, video on demand locations, Fandango Now, Voodoo, etc. Can you do one more in like 20 seconds? I hate to cut you off. Um, sure. You know what? I want to just mention there's one called... Uh, uh, the Wolf of Snow Hollow, uh, you know, uh, which is basically about a, a kind of a potential uh, werewolf situation in a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, wintry Pot town up in the mountains. Potential, potential uh, werewolf it's, it's situation. Really, and, <laughs> <laughs> We've got a potential werewolf we situation. Probably elaborate down on here, that, uh... but you know what? I really feel the smart thing to do is to just tell people, besides love and monsters, if you really want to see something scary this weekend, uh, you know what? Go. To Netflix, go to Netflix because The Haunting of Hill House is a been chilling miniseries. Uh, most recent adaptation of author Shirley Jackson's classic durable horror novel, and uh, it's loosely based on the nineteen. The plot's familiar: a wholesome family moves into an old mansion to renovate it, but something unearthly lurks within. Um, there's also another uh, series in this. Uh, haunting miniseries collection commissioned by Netflix, Haunting of Bly Manor, but Hill House is the, is the real winner as far as I'm concerned. The Haunting uh, of Hill features. House. I love it. I, um, uh, Michael, we have yeah, to wrap so, up. I could talk to you forever. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just saying as ghost stories go, Haunting of Hill House is truly scary stuff. I, I, I love that you spend time with us. Uh, all of the... 
recommendations and more you can find at the Marina Times. He writes his column for the Marina Times. Michael Snyder is our man. He's called the Culture Blaster, at Culture Blaster on Twitter and YouTube. Thank you, Michael, and until next week, bye-bye. Take care, Michael. Guys. Woo. There he goes. Nice.